Um, may I have a motion to return to the regular meeting? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries. Okay, moving on. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. And Ms. Flynn, the roll call, please. Kelly Cahill here. Linda Gaines here. Dave Goddard here. Larry Scott here. Edward McCormick present. Charles McLeod here. Mary Ann Meaden here. Marion Quinn here. Mark Tonicor here. Okay. Uh, reading of the district mission. Our mission is to empower all students to be self-directed, lifelong learners who willingly contribute to their community and lead passionate, purposeful lives. Yeah. Item two, approval of the agenda. We have a motion. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries. Okay. Next item, item B, open a public hearing on the tax exemption. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. And second, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, you aye, say aye. aye. Opposed, abstention. Okay, we are open for discussion or for public comment. Three minutes per speaker, if you would care to speak on the tax exemption. There being none, I would uh, move to close the public hearing. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. And a motion a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Motion carried. Moving on to item three, correspondence. Anyone have any correspondence? They wish to share. Okay. Going right along. Okay, board president's remarks. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to express this board's sincere condolences to our colleague, Dr. Linda Gaines, and her family on the passing of her mother, Mrs. Shirley Domzalski. And anyway, thank you very much. Um, I feel that way. Uh, sec my second item, uh, I want to congratulate uh, Amy Green, who is our new executive director of the Arlington Education Foundation. Uh, I wish her great success as she leads us into the future. Uh, also want to uh, uh, make a, a comment about uh, Mary Beth Kaczynski, Kaminsky for all the hard work she's done over her time and her stewardship of the Arlington Education Foundation. You will be missed very much. And those conclude my remarks. Dr. Moyer. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to start off by congratulating one of our teachers, Nicole McMorris, who uh, is a kindergarten teacher at Knox on Road and um, officially achieved national uh, board certification, which is uh, a very intense, rigorous process. So congratulations to her, very proud of you for that. Um, then my superintendent comments also, um, we're all aware uh, that we had a very unfortunate incident at the high school in which a parent uh, entered the high school with their child um, who was uh, involved in a prearranged fight that uh, was, was scheduled to take place at the school. Um, that's something that we've been seeing um, with some of the fights that have been occurring is that people have uh, arranged for these outside of school and then come to school and designated a certain time and place for these to occur. Um, and in this situation, 
the parent uh, was able to sneak into the building uh, with their child. Um, it, it was it was an extremely unfortunate situation. Um, I I do uh, know that the high school administration, the security people, all of our staff are very very uh, diligent and proactive about the um, safety and security practices that they have in place. Unfortunately, in this particular case, uh, we had a breach of security. One of the biggest issues related to um, that particular incident that the high school has had some difficulty with is enforcing the uh, requirement that students wear their ID badges. Um, I was informed that we only had about 15% compliance in that. That was an estimate, but in general, those types of things are difficult to enforce and, and quote unquote police. However, they are essential to preserving the security of that building. We need to make sure that the only people in that building are the people who belong in that building at any given time for any specific purpose. So one of the steps that we're gonna take moving forward is to create a building-wide process to actively enforce the wearing of student IDs. That's, that's, uh, that's uh, part one of what we're looking at moving forward. Part two is there will be active engagement with each house and all students around the expectations of the ID, what they will need their ID for, um, how they will be incentivized to wear their ID and make sure they have it with them. Uh, but in addition to that, there's also going to be education around a new law that's going into effect in February, in which uh, people, um, uh, in which it will be illegal for people to post videos on social media sites of other people without their permission. Um, our school resource officer, Deputy Montoya, will be a part of these conversations. Um, it's important to note that we are aware of through our investigation of social media accounts and the interviews of students and other, other people uh, that witnessed that event, that there were probably around 20 students who were aware that this fight was gonna take place at, that, at the school that day. We're gonna do a lot of active education around the fact that it's a collective responsibility for everybody in, at the school to help ensure that we have a safe environment. Um, and that includes uh, bystanders and how other people can play a role in trying to prevent these types of things from occurring in the future. Uh, tomorrow evening, Dr. Salamini, our high school principal, is hosting a parent meeting in which he will, and, and um, our school resource officer, um, will go over similar types of information only targeted toward a parent audience about the practices that are in place at the school, the expectations at the school, and how they can partner with the school to try to help make sure that um, everybody can feel comfortable that their children are safe every day when they come to school. Those are some of the things that we're gonna be taking a look at going forward. Um, I do, however, want to um, interject some, some uh, thoughts that I have uh, in relation to different people who, who have suggested uh, as a part of their reaction to this incident that the school and the district are not taking these types of situations seriously, that they're not, um, uh, that they're sort of tacitly condoning uh, different types of behaviors that compromise the safety. And that's absolutely untrue. And I need to refute that. Uh, that, per that perspective is not an accurate perspective at all. In fact, um, as I put my notes together for the meeting tonight, we have had 33 superintendent hearings. Superintendent hearings are uh, required if the intent is to suspend students for more than five days from school. We've had 33 of those hearings this year, not counting the two that we had today. Uh, and I don't have the results of those two hearings uh, yet. Um, I don't have the report from the hearing officer. However, of the 33 that I referenced, zero to five uh, or uh, four of them resulted in suspensions of zero to five days. In other words, there were different types of agreements that, that were put in place in which the student was not um, removed from school for more than five days. Two of them were 11 to 15 day suspensions. Three were 21 to 30 day suspensions. 
Eight were 31 to 45 day suspensions. Five were 46 to 60 day suspensions and nine were suspensions for the remainder of the year. So I, I, it is completely inaccurate to suggest that people are not taking um, the types of behaviors related to weapons, drugs, uh, sexual harassment, or other serious infractions of the code of conduct seriously. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. So I, I felt that I needed to interject some of that information in, into my report. I also wanted to make some suggestions and recommendations to the board to, for the Board of Education to consider organizationally. Currently, all of our security practices, uh, uh, all of, I should, well, that's not accurate. Currently, the district contracts with an organization called Alteris um, to um, not only consult with us about different trends that are going on around the country and how to handle different situations that may occur, but also we have a um, uh, security director that is um, uh, a consultant that is on site at the high school with us five days a week. And we have a great relationship with that organization and the person currently in place is doing a very good job. There's no concerns about the performance. However, by contracting out those services, there are a couple pieces that we think we could strengthen if that position were an internal position. <clears throat> and one of them is the ability to supervise and direct our actual security personnel and greeters. Currently, our high school principal, some of our other principals, and um, uh, Jill Post, our assistant superintendent, even though that even though they're actively involved in doing a lot of advising and a lot of consulting on on what we should do and how we should do it, because they're not employ our employee, they cannot directly supervise those other employees who are our employee, and that can become at different times a little bit cumbersome and taxing in terms of them being able to balance all the other responsibilities that they have to do uh, in, in the, the other areas of their responsibilities. Um, we, in the proposal that I put together for you, I'm suggesting that we create a, a, a director of safety and security position and um, that we would then post it, interview and fill it. Um, the cost, would be the current contract with Alteris is $149,796. We still think that if we hired that position internally, that we would um, uh, want to contract with uh, Alteris for some services and some support. And the estimate for that uh, dollar amount would be $40,035. Um, so we think that um, it, that the new position in terms of personnel would be close to cost neutral. And that when you figure in the extra consulting services, um, we're probably looking at a, a total estimated direct increase to our operating budget for um, security operations of approximately $75,000 if this proposal were agreed to by the board. We do think that because a lot of those positions are filled by retired law enforcement personnel, we may we may not have the easiest time filling it. And if we don't find the right person, we would then continue in our current relationship. But the reason I say that is the state recently lifted an earnings cap for employees who are retired from different retirement systems because everybody's been having such a difficult time finding employees. That is, at this point, we have no indication that that's going to continue. Um, and if it doesn't continue, um, you may have people that uh, would not be legally allowed to apply for this position without jeopardizing their, their existing retirement from their other system. So that's the first part of the uh, recommendation. The second part of the recommendation is that we would establish a district health and safety committee. The, there's currently an ad hoc board committee that has been running for uh, slightly more than a year. Um, the board would have the discretion as to whether or not it wants to continue in, in that capacity or not. That's, that's, a different, that's a different committee than what I'm recommending. The um, state law requires that we have a district health and safety committee. Right now, we have something that we call our district emergency response team. 
And that is what we have been um, uh, so, sort of been our way of complying with that expectation. However, the purpose of the district emergency response team and what's codified as to what the expectations are of the health and safety of the district health and safety committee. Um, we're, we're not currently uh, in compliance with all the aspects of that regulation. And I'm recommending that if we establish this committee, we could have a board member represent, representative on that committee. We could have parent representation on that committee. All of that's laid out in law. We would be able to make regular reports to the board and um, we, we would assure that we're in compliance and I just, uh, I, I would recommend that, um, and, and if we had a district um, a dis district director, internal district director, that person would be uh, the person who would be the, the primary point person in terms of leading the work of that committee. So um, under this scenario, um, Jill Post would still, do all of the work that she currently does related to health and safety matters that have to do with uh, student discipline matters and nurses, um, you know, health, health related types of things and, and all the student services related things. Um, and she would, you know, still have to technically be the person's direct supervisor. However, uh, Dr. Salamini and, and Ms. Post under this scenario would have to would have less direct day-to-day -day responsibilities over actually supervising the um, the activities of, of our security personnel. But um, but the other health and safety things, you know, would stay with with uh, Jill Post's office. Um, and she would still have, because there's there's such a um, because these things interrelate to such a large degree, things related to technology, um, you know, and and other other aspects of facilities and things like that, there would need to be a, still need to be a lot of mutual coordination. Um, these the, the, the person wouldn't be operating in a vacuum. There would be a lot of a lot of different people working together on these issues in in similar ways. So. I'm, I'm putting that out there because if the board is in agreement um, that with the with the recommendation that I provided for you in the packet, we would then want to put this uh, up for board approval so that we could get the position posted and begin that process and then also put the things in motion for getting this health and safety committee established for the 23-24 school year. So that, uh, concludes my comments on safety and security. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next agenda item, public comment for agenda items only. Uh, this is the first of two opportunities for people to address the board. When your name is called from the speaker's list for agenda items, you may speak for up to three minutes on agenda items only. Your remarks must be addressed to the board. All speakers must conduct themselves in a civil manner. Although we do not engage in dialogue, we are listening. Comments about individual district personnel or students is not permitted. If you leave your contact information with Mrs. Flynn, our district clerk, the superintendent, or one of his staff will contact you as soon as possible. Mrs. Flynn. Hi, good evening, Liz Zitch, Cunningham Drive, LaGrangeville. Um, I am commenting on uh, agenda item 8B as it um, relates to school safety plans and I guess now superintendent's remarks. It's refreshing to hear that a lot of these things are um, being addressed. I have a sixth grader and a ninth grader. Does my ninth grader go to Arlington High School? No. Uh, we saw a lot of safety concerns over the past decade getting worse and worse, um, um, especially with the murder last year in the parking lot. And we decided it was better um, in my family to have my child uh, go to private school. I know that um, you know I'm privileged uh, to be able to do that, but my best friend's children still go to school here. My neighbors teach in Arlington High School. The kids that I drive to lacrosse practice on the weekends still go to school uh, in Arlington High School. My cousin's kids still attend school, uh, Arlington High School. So uh, if I see a glaring safety concern, yes, I, I am going to speak up about it. 
I'm glad we're all on the same page that what happened last week is unacceptable. It's as simple as that. I don't believe um, the SROs or the security monitors are to blame though. I think that they're um, in a lot of scenarios, their hands are tied. Um, I know that a lot of the times for less um, severe infractions, you know, the, the administration doesn't want to press charges. For instance, um, security guards aren't allowed to put their hands on children. I don't understand if a child is beating another child, how the security guard is going to help break up the fight, you know, using some kind of Jedi mind tricks or something. I, to me, it doesn't make sense. Um, I know that the problem stems from the home. There's a lack of morals. There's a lack of values. There's a lack of respect. We can't do anything about that. What we can do is control what happens within the walls of the school. I hear you talk about the IDs. The students don't wear their IDs, only 15%, but that's hard to enforce. Why is it hard to enforce? It's a rule. Kids wear IDs. You go into the school. You don't have the ID. You go to the office. They print you an ID. To me, that's something that can uh, be overcome. The sad thing in all of this um, is that a lot of these kids that are um, involved in a lot of this stuff, the only way to help them is to educate them. Education is the key to get them out of the vicious cycle uh, of poverty. And I don't know, um, you know if we're doing the best job with that. I know that we call the new program the restorative justice program. I think a lot of these kids might need a little bit more um, tough love. I think that order needs to be restored in that high school, even for lesser infraction, uh, infractions like smoking or vaping in the bathrooms, um, those kind of things. We just have to have an orderly and safe environment, period. I thank you for addressing this and taking it seriously. I think hiring three security guards is a step in the right direction. You might need like 10. And may I suggest instead of- Thank you. Okay. I, I would normally respond to a couple things um, in my uh, uh, closing remarks, but um, at this point, Mark, if you're okay with it, I'd like to stick to this particular topic so that we can move on to the rest of our agenda. And there was something I probably should have referred to in my opening remarks related to the role of law enforcement. Would you be okay if I just interject? Go ahead. Thank you. So, I have made it clear to our school resource officers and our sheriff's department that if there is a situation that merits pressing charges, that I will support it. I, I do believe that that's a slightly different attitude or approach than, than may have been common in the past from what I've heard, but um, that doesn't mean we wanna run around arresting people. That's not my point. But what I'm saying is that there is something that requires a criminal um, a, a, a law enforcement involvement um, and, and at the discretion of the sheriff's department, they believe that uh, charges are warranted. I have made it clear that we would support that. that. But there are issues that law enforcement faces that people may not be completely aware of as it relates to different situations. So for example, um, if a person is um, under the age of 16, they, they have different restrictions as to whether they can charge a person or not. Um, if people, if, 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 if there are mutual, uh, mutual combatants as opposed to an aggressor and a victim, there are different situations that are, that the, that the police, um, uh, that law enforcement has to take into account and that the, the, um, uh, criminal justice system takes into account when these things go to court. So there, it's not that there's always a reluctance, um, to pursue different things, sometimes it doesn't happen because the families themselves decide that they don't want to press charges. And, and there are some things that the school has the ability to press charges for if it chooses to go that route. There are other things where the individuals have to be, have to decide that they want to move in that direction. And if they decide that they don't want to move in that direction, then, you know, that's, that's no longer a school matter. So I just want to clarify that. And I also, um, if a security officer needs to intervene um, to break up a fight, 
they're, they're, they can intervene to break up a fight. So that's just not an accurate statement. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where that, where that comes from. Um, so that will, there will be no closing superintendent remarks. So now I get, I'll turn the meeting over to other people, I guess, but. Okay. Thank you for those clarifications. Okay, moving on. Uh, no, item seven, reports and discussion items. Arlington High School Student Government, Dr. Salamini and students. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, tonight, joining me is Sam Soliday and Mark Lumet. Uh, Sam is the president of our student government. Um, Mr. Lumet is the um, advisor for the staff uh, for the student government organization, student council. So they're just going to put together uh, students came together and put together a little uh, presentation about the role of our student government at our education. So I'll turn it over to Sam. Uh, I'm Sam, I'm a junior at high school. And this is just a little bit of a little so far this year. Uh, thank you for letting me do this. And here we go. This is, we're starting with the freshman student government and they're all the um, members' names. It's not switching. No. Do I have to point it? Oh, there we go. There you go. Um, the first thing the freshman um, student government is doing is donating used sneakers from either the staff or members of the school, the students, or security guards, et cetera. And this is to help save the planet, as they say in the bottom right there, and to help recycle and help families in need in the, in the surrounding area. Uh, next up is the freshman student uh, spirit of giving. This is, we su they support a, a specific family in the district and they donate toys, food, regardless of uh, anything they need. And they give that family for the rest of the year and they support that family. Following that is freshman movie night. This is a new thing that they introduced this year. And this is an um, effort to raise funds for their uh, class of 2026. They graduate in four years, so they'll need another prom, other events they want to host. So then that's uh, beginning efforts of that. Next is the sophomore student government, and this is the care closets. This has been in effect for uh, a long time now. It's to help students who don't have um, as many resources as others, and it's a, a care closet found in our house offices that can be used. Like you can find toothbrush, um, toothbrushes, um, toothpaste, soaps, like deodorant, etc. And it's free for students to use. Any student can come and get it. Um, except the only thing is that not a lot of students know about it. So our efforts are to improve um, connection between the house offices and students so they will be able to use these resources more often. Um, this is the junior class student government. Um, we are hosting Mr. Arlington, an annual event every single year for many Arlington. It's like a male beauty pageant, basically. And I'm pretty sure all of you know about it. Uh, next is the food truck festival that we hosted earlier this year. It did extremely well. Uh, the homecoming raffle baskets and face painting was was during um, home uh, during the homecoming game. Um, they've been planning and organizing their junior prom, and they're transferring the remaining funds for this year into the senior class, which they'll have next year. Um, this is their this is the senior class and all their members. The senior events this year have been the senior sunrise and breakfast, um, the puff bowl, seniors in the city, et cetera, and they're going to have their prom later this year. This is the student body government, so me and those other three members there. Um, the Arlington Homecoming and Tailgate, um, it was against Ketchum, one of our rival schools. We raised over $4,000 in total, and $1,500 came from the Tailgate event that we started this year. The tailgate was a new idea to raise money for the school. The event was extremely successful as we sold out our tickets prior to the game. They provided, um, they provided food and a safe location for students to stay before the game, and that helped with reducing the amount of like fights, um, arguments between students. And the money raised went towards uh, other school events and our food drives. Now our holiday food drives. Our food drives contribute to the helping helping Arlington families in need. Um, every week, home runs into the school competed to see who could raise the most could raise the most food. Um, the winner getting a donut party every week. Both Thanksgiving and Christmas drives were successful in getting food to the families. Um, we successfully we successfully delivered forty three. Um, excuse me, um, delivering food baskets to 43 of Arlington families that needed this um, source. And we use those funds from the homecoming to cover the remaining amount. Um, lastly, these are some things that 
aren't as big as Neil, I guess, but we, Jasmine and I, a member who weren't here, who isn't here at the moment, um, we're hosts of the Martin Luther King tribute at the high school with the assistant Melissa Earlbacher over there. Um, she was great, by the way, and the entire Arlington district, we raised awareness for equality. And this is the first time we've held this event ever since COVID, and we look forward to hosting it more in the future. And the winter ball is, the students um, have planned a winter ball um, next month. Students have been wanting a dance aside from their prom since last year, and I've been getting um, a lot of angry messages about that for a long time now. And this will be a host in the high school and should be very cost efficient, so it shouldn't cost that much money. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Anyone uh, have any questions? I have a question. I don't know if it's really for Sam or Dr. Solomon or Mr. Remet, but the care closet, that's something that I always thought was really special and important. And I don't know if that's different from the closet that has clothes. It seemed to be in the past, the way it was explained to us that students who were interested had to go somewhere and get a key to the room. I'm wondering what the current status is and if we make it now a little bit easier for people to sort of not as obtrusively go in and sort of check on these things that they might need, but they don't want to make a big deal about it. Thanks, Sam. I understand. It's nice to meet you in person. Um, um, so about that. So it is true that you need to get a key from a, like a member of the house and stuff. And I do agree with you that I think we should address that and we should make it much more easy for students to um, get that, get whatever they need. Right. right. And because I guess it could be very embarrassing for right. them in some cases. Right. So I think that is something that we need to work on. And okay. that is a good idea. So thank right. you for bringing that up. Just to add in, so the um, the clothing closet, um, what that is, is a, a room that has a lot of clothes, uh, gently used, new, various states. Students in need, um, it's done as unobtrusively as possible. Student goes um, to one of our uh, house secretaries in each of the four houses and goes upstairs very like during the period. So it's not in the middle of the hall passings and such. Mm -hmm. So that way the student can go in, take what they need and leave as quietly as possible. The students have also used it if there's been an accident or damage to clothing during the day. And we've sent, uh, you know, they could just go up and no one's really overseeing them and, you know, uh, hovering. So they're given that privacy and that time to take care of what they need. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the personal hygiene products, those are housed in each of the houses and it's usually been off to the side of a closet and they just go in, take what they need and leave. There's even, there's no need to even check in. It's students, uh, it's very visible to where it is located. So uh, the possibility of making it even less noticeable or even uh, easier for students to get to, we'll look into that with student government as well as the staff member who oversees the closet upstairs as well. So we'll Thanks. take that look. Thanks. Can I ask you a follow-up question? The dance, yes. is that only for seniors or for all the high school students? The dance is actually a winter ball. Uh, that would be really more geared towards uh, the junior class uh, uh -huh. and seniors and anyone, really. But it's uh, more focused for the student government taking a look at it, introducing it. So it's actually going to be open 9 through 12. Okay. Yeah, because I think that that's really great now that we're all trying to encourage people to be yeah. more social. I think having an opportunity to mingle. When I was in yes. high school, we had dances. You met people at dances. We have a huge high school. You can One meet of the people. things is actually finding uh, time in the calendar of the high school between all the different events yeah. uh, and activities and sporting events and clubs and groups. Uh, Mr. Ouimet has, I think, two or three dates and it just uh, it's scheduling has been more difficult. Yeah. Getting the kids' interest has been very easy. It's getting the schedule into the calendar and getting the um, it up and running as well. As, but that, that's been the hardest part of it. So we are looking forward to it to bring back that concept of dance, even uh, having um, them come and celebrate and just relax. Right. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Okay. All right. Moving on. Um, budget workshop. Transportation and Operations and Maintenance. Mr. Sheldon.
Good evening. Uh, so tonight will be our second uh, presentation on the budget with a little bit of extra focus on uh, EVs because that came up at the first meeting and you'd ask some question. I try to get some additional information, at least up to the, up to the date that we have. Uh, we have Mr. McNamara here. He's our director of uh, transportation, and he has been doing quite a bit of work with our vendors to uh, analyze and study and try and figure out what this uh, this new ruling is going to mean to us and to how we might implement it. So I want to thank him for coming. So, so I'm going to start out with the operations and maintenance budget. So uh, this is a slide that you've seen many times in the past. Um, I have updated it for the question that was asked at the last meeting in terms of the number of people that we have in grounds and the number of people that we have in maintenance. And so I included there the supervisor that also works in grounds and with maintenance. So there are thir currently 13 groundsmen, including the supervisor and 14 maintenance workers. But, but this is, uh, you know, over a million four hundred and fifty one thousand square feet of building space it's 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 an enormous amount of uh real estate to 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 keep under uh to keep from leaking actually so uh and you know 400 400 acres is a lot to mow so um uh, that's basically uh, uh the landscape of what o m is working with um, so this year, a little bit more than normal, we have been trying to keep operations and maintenance quite low. Uh, this year, we're, 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 we're going to be probably across the board in a lot of categories because of inflationary pressures, because of changes in supplies, because of salaries, because of, uh, you know, electricity. Uh, the bulk of this raise is probably in electricity. Um, and, and fuel oils and those types of things. The last one there, the last bullet there, I'd like to point your attention to is a new bathroom trailer and meeting space for the Arlington bus garage. So you'll know that uh, the district uh, several years ago went out for a proposition to make upgrades and, and changes to two bus garages uh, because there were changes in the uh, budgets and, and things at that time, we were only able to uh, do the garage here at Arlington or here at uh, LaGrange. And so the other garage was has not been able to be uh, built at this time because we didn't have the money to do that. Um, well, HR has been doing a lot of work and they've been uh, going around and they've been meeting with our uh, employees and things like that. And they've gotten quite a bit of feedback about the, the differences uh, between the facilities and things like that. So this is an attempt to try to improve area uh, that area in the district. Um, it would be about $80,000 a year. Um, it's an aidable expense. I probably will put it on as a proposition and make it a lease to space, similar to how we had done Tucker Drive, if you remember from years back. And it'll probably be in the same kind of format. We probably enter into some sort of five year agreement or whatever that is, put it on as a separate proposition. If it passes, it passes, but it doesn't. Why is it in operations and maintenance? Because it actually goes under the uh, building use uh, um, rules, not the transportation. So it gets recorded in operations and maintenance because it's a it's considered a building and it would get building aid. So this is a graphic for operations and maintenance and the light bars are the actual expenditures and the blue bars are the um, budgets. So the two solid blue lines at the at the far right, uh, the, far, the furthest to the right is the proposed budget uh, at the moment. And the one inside that is the current budget. And th there's no light bar on it because we don't we haven't finished the year so there's there's no actual expenditures to record against it at this point so um we've been trying to hold uh so over the last 10 years you can see that the budgets have not grown within operations and maintenance and we've been trying to hold the line on on the expenditures in that area and we've been doing it for a very long time but you know inflationary pressures and things like that uh the electricity bill going up quite a bit um, is causing this these increases. Transportation's a little worse um, in terms of percentage increase, um, but there's a few things uh, why that is. So, you know, salary increases, um, 
is probably a little over 50% of the increase. Uh, you'll know that we made some pretty radical changes to try to encourage bus drivers to come to the district. Well, that has a cost and we're now reflecting that in the budget to, to match that. Um, that we do have increased fuel costs, insurance costs are gonna be going up, um, the materials and supplies, those types of things. There's an electric bus and a charger built into this into this budget, and that's probably another 40% of, of, of the increase. So between just the salaries and the electric bus and the bus charger, it's probably 90% of the increase that you see. So this is the same uh, bar graph, but you know, obviously it looks a little worse than the you know, nice smooth one for operations and maintenance. But in the same vein, the furthest right is the budget that's gonna be proposed. Uh, the reason why it's such a large um, uh, you know, spike above the others is a good portion of it is the electric bus and the charger. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. So, so if you go to the far left and you see what the budget was in 13, 14 and how we have been budgeting less as we went along, the reason for that is um, transportation is a unique expense within the school district. It is a, uh, it's a categorical aid, which means that you get aid based on the expenses from the prior year. So by overstating the budgets, you are overstating your aid. So when we plan our budgets, we are, we were saying we're going to get X dollars in aid, but if you're overstated in your, your, your uh, transportation aid, you aren't going to get that. When the, when the final numbers come in, you're just not going to get it. So I've wanted to be right at the expenditure level right at where the budget is. Um, as you can see in 17, 18, probably didn't have enough budget there. So we increased the budget in 18, 19. We had the anomalous year in 20, you know, late 1920 and then 2021 with, with COVID effects. And then in 21, 22, uh, we used all of the budget in 22, 23, hopefully we'll not use all of it, but we'll hopefully we'll be close to that. And then, you know, 23, 24 is whatever that's going to be. But that's how to read that screen. And that's why that is that. And, that, and that's why there was less and less put on the budget lines. So electric vehicles. So in 2027, you're going to, we have to start purchasing electric buses. Can't buy anything after 2027 that's not an electric bus. So all of the buses that we have out there, can't buy any of them anymore. In 2035, all of the buses that we actually own must be electric or an electric equivalent. It could be like a hydrogen, just have to be zero emissions. But at this point, electric is the leading, the leading uh, mechanism. And these, uh, hopefully, we're hopeful that these deadlines may change as time progresses because they're very aggressive, just, just so you know. Um, so an average bus, you know, big bus is uh, is about 400 to four, 435,000 to, to buy one EV bus. Uh, the state aid runs the same. However, the, the current law is that for an EV bus, they're going to give us eight over a 12-year time period, whereas now we get buses over a five-year time period. That's a dramatic change, a dramatic change. Um, we are hopeful that, uh, that, that we will get aid back to the five-year in, in interval, but at the moment, the law is that it would be 12 years. Uh, you can also lease buses. Um, generally, I, I don't recommend leasing buses, but, but it is an option. So there are some uh, voucher programs out there. And the, this one here is from NYSERDA. It's the Truck Voucher Incentive Program. It's been funded by um, the VW settlement. Uh, they'll give you up to $200,000 and up to five buses. These are buses that have to be 2009 and diesel and older. We only have two left because we've been converting to propane over time. We're going to be punished for being ahead of the curve. So um, many of the other districts that have older buses that will have more that will qualify for this. Um, that's just the way the law is written at the moment. Um, these are some details about how long it takes um, uh, from the vendor standpoint. The vendors would like us to, to sign on board with them and, and to use them as the application and because it's because the process is, is, is kind of lengthy and you got to kind of stay on top of it. But um, this is their information about um, 
you know, what we, what we could expect. And um, it's why I budgeted 400,000. My hope is that we might be able to spin that into two electric buses so that we would get so that we would be able to file for this uh, for this particular uh, grant, and then we would spin that into two buses instead of just one. And if it doesn't work, then we've got enough for one. But I think it's important for us to get at least one so that we can start figuring out how these things work because uh, they operate completely differently than than uh, than than the machines that we have now. Um, there is additional monies from the uh, from the Environmental Bond Act. And that's another 500 million. Um, and, and we're waiting on the final details of how to apply for those grants. The federal EPA clean bus rebate program has five-year funding. So, so if you go back to the, to the one slide where by 2027, we're not allowed to buy anything except uh, electric buses. And then eight years later, the entire fleet has to be converted over. Right now, we're about on a 12-year cycle to replace buses. So we started on propanes six, seven years ago. We're only halfway through, a little over halfway through on all of the diesel buses that we have. So that's how long we've been committed to this. And we have to do this in 50% less time. So these are three times more expensive and we have, to, we have a lot less time to, to operate um to to get to to meet these 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 deadlines um so this is uh this is that program for for grants and um you can see you know this is a maximum of 25 the last one was a maximum of five we have over 120 big buses alone so however we get to this there's not going to be nearly at least proposed not nearly enough grant money on the table to get us to where we need to go because we're dealing with much bigger numbers. We're not, we're not a small mom and pop shop and we ain't got 17 buses out there. We've got lots. So um, here's some statistics about the charging. So there's different styles of chargers that, that we're gonna have to deal with. And um, the important thing to, to, to learn here, I believe is that there are fast chargers and there are slow chargers. Fast chargers burn out batteries faster, so you want to try to avoid that style. There are programmable chargers, which are a little better because they're a little bit more intelligent about when it is that they will be charging and when it is that they will be using electricity. Um, and every single bus needs its own charger. So at $18,000 a pop times 250, you know, so just rounded off to 20,000 at 250 buses, that's about $5 million just for the chargers. Then you have to install the infrastructure to connect them all and you have to get the wiring done. So, so that's gonna be a, a, healthy, a healthy number when we get there. Um, the difference between a level two and a level three charger is that a level three charger is programmable and it will be a quick charger. So I'm going to move on to the next comment, how this dovetails. Yeah, can I ask a quick question? Sure. In, in terms of uh, infrastructure to Arlington Bus Garage and LaGrange Bus Garage, that's not our responsibility, but in terms of getting electrons to us, what conversations have we had with Central Hudson about what upgrades are they going to be having to deal with, not only for us, but all of the school districts in terms of in infrastructure upgrades? So... Uh, right now, the vendors are doing studies with individual uh, school districts. So what they do is they'll come in and they take a look at all of our routing. And the, the, one of the primary things is to figure out how many routes that we have, how long they take, how far they're going, where they're going, so that you can figure out how many buses need to be on fast chargers versus slow chargers. So if you're on a long, long run, uh, for the entire day for a bus, it may be that that bus has to be switched up. In other words, it can do a long run in the morning, but then in the day, during the day, it, it, it sits and then it does a short one in the afternoon because it can't do two long ones. It can't do a long one in the morning and a long one in the afternoon. But we have to figure out how many routes are going to need a fast charge in between so that we can figure out how many fast chargers we need versus the slow chargers. 
So there's going to be a study. We, I, my recommendation is that we get a study done of all of our bus routes in conjunction with how an electric bus works with that so that we can figure out how many electrons that we need. So then we can have the conversation with the local utility to find out what power they can provide and then what transformers we need to either upgrade or, or, or downgrade. So it's very complicated, I think, in terms of we have to get information before we can get that type of information. Is it, is it possible that you know you might end up in situations where there would be charging stations at, at individual buildings? schools, elementary schools, or something like that? Where buses... I'm going to say no for buses, uh, okay, because typically they would not be there long enough for them to to make any meaningful impact, but. Uh, maybe that's a recommendation that comes out of the study that we could put stanchions there, but um, I'm just trying to think through the practicality of that and what that might, might, might look like, you know what I mean? So not, not sure that that's going to work because I mean, where would you put them? And then how would you get the electric line from the, from the charger station to the side of the bus? If it goes across the sidewalk, then we're going to have pedestrians walking across. We're going to have kids near high electricity. Like, like it, it, you know, the, there could be some very real logistical problems with that style. So uh, the other thing about these buses is many aspects of them are high electricity, which means that the normal mechanic can't touch them because they'll, if they hit the wrong wire, they're, it'll kill them. So uh, the other thing about these buses is if they catch fire, they're, 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 we, that's another reason why we want to get one. We want to work with all of our local utilities. So we want to work with fire department. We want to work with police. We want to work with anyone that's going to be a, an emergency responder so that if they come to the scene of an accident, they know what to do when they get there because they are going to behave very differently than the buses that they're used to seeing. So there, there's, there's a lot going on with this that has to be worked out and studied. Um, EVs are here to stay. All of that being said, they're here to stay. There is a evolution or revolution or whatever you want to call it worldwide where we are electrifying vehicles and we believe that it's here and it's here to stay. So um, with this ruling, uh, we are going to have to, uh, we're going to have to adjust and uh, figure it out. So uh, vendors are recommending that we do what it, what it is that I'm recommending or I'm recommending what they're recommending uh, so that we dip our toe in and we can start investigating some of these logistical issues so that we can at least figure out how they how they operate. So is that study included in the budget for next school year? I did put some money in for that specific, for the study of that, for one charger and for one bus. And if we can get a grant, then it would be two buses. Okay. And I'll figure out how to get the, the second charger. But um, yeah, we, 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 we definitely need to get one, I think, because we need to start learning about how it's going to behave. And this is the second question I believe that you asked, how much would it cost to place air conditioning on uh, a conventional versus a, a, an electric bus? Uh, and those are the prices. So 14,000 for the gas, diesel or propane and about 17,000 on an EV bus. Interesting thing about an EV bus with the air conditioning, it probably is uh, easier to air condition a, a large bus than it is to heat them. So there's no change in the battery size that you would need to run them, but the device itself would be about $17,000. And currently we don't order any of our large buses with, with air conditioning, so. Do any, do any school districts? Not that I know of. Most school districts uh, will place air conditioning on, a, on their middle mini buses because those are IEP right. directed and those are the students that are most sensitive. Uh, many of those students will uh, have it actually in their IEP that right. they need to be uh, conditioned spaces. Okay. Kevin, the, 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 this uh, requirement does not include hybrids in any way, correct? Uh, correct. And the, you're going to need to have all your mechanics trained on the maintenance of them. Correct. Uh, they're going to need new tools. Correct. Are there going to be any configuration changes to our new garage? Because we now have electric buses aside from charging. Yeah. So I think what will happen is that... Um, Fortunately or unfortunately, I think that our mechanics would be would be relegated to the more standard kinds of things that go wrong with buses. So that would be brakes, 
that would be um, light bulbs, that would be seats, and basically anything anything that goes wrong on the bus from the frame up, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, anything with the seats, anything with the, the sides, the windows, the, the lights and all of those kinds of things, because that's low voltage would be, uh, would be uh, what our mechanics would be working on. Anything that dealt with the batteries or the, or the motors would probably have to go back to the manufacturer. Okay. Is that correct? Any other questions? I have a question. Kelly. So slide seven. I think when we first started talking about this, you were saying these were proposals, but this was passed. This is a law. Okay. So it just seems, as you were saying, very aggressive. It is very aggressive. It's I got mean, the entire industry in a complete turmoil. So it's very difficult to believe that with all of the expenses school districts have, they're really saying in 12 years, you can't have a single regular bus. I'm wondering sort of about... I don't know, the lobbying arm or how, how you're talking or business directors or school districts are talking to Albany, because this is, I mean, for a large district, this is crazy expensive. I agree. I think that this is, this is, I, I, I mean, it's definitely at the, at the land of lobbying and, uh, you know, making our voices heard as best we can presenting the facts. But I, I know that uh you know, NIAP, which is the New York Association for People Transportation. I know that ASBO, which is the Association of School Business Official. I know that NISBA, which is the School Boards Association. Uh, to my knowledge, at least all of those organizations are lobbying and trying to uh, figure out, cajole, straight, you know, lengthen. Like, right. like I, nobody's against the concept right. of wanting a, a a zero emission bus. So, so let's just right. put that aside. But it's the aggressiveness by which it's going to cause us to react and act yeah. that is uh, troublesome to try to figure all of this out that fast. And it is a lot of money. So when you start seeing, you know, future propositions, if you're balking at a couple million dollars, you're going to be, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to really have a hard time when, when, when the, you know, let's just, well, let's just do 120 buses in eight years. So 120 buses in eight years is about, uh, what is that, 16? No. So if you did 20, 20 buses a year for eight years, that's 160. So that's too many. So let's, let's make it 16. So if you did like 16 buses at 400,000, that's, uh, yeah, 6.4 million. 6 just in big buses, haven't done anything with the little buses at that point. And your current proposition is 2.2 million. Right. Just to give you a flavor of some big numbers. I don't know, Mary, and I'm looking at you. <laughs> it seems like something to advocate. I mean, people have to be reasonable. Well, NISBA does have a resolution about that that was passed. So, I mean, they're, they are on it. Mm-hmm. We will probably be picketing somebody someday about this. Yeah. I was just trying I think, to give I you a flavor of I think you're what right that is on the plate. It's the runway. Like, the runway is too short for this kind of thing for a, a district to absorb. Well, because we'd have to be immediately purchasing you know, one, one twelfth of our fleet this year, this coming year. If we're I'm a little reluctant. Target. I'm a little reluctant to, to, to do the dive in approach at this point, because I'm hoping that as this thing progresses along, cooler minds come to, come right. to, to, to yeah. bear and we won't have, you know, totally just, Destroyed the thing. You know, we, we've got other issues to deal with. Right. We've got buildings that we need to improve. We've got programs that we need to support. So like, in every school district, there's never enough money to do all of the things that you would like to do. So it's choices, it's risk management, it's, but this is a law. So I, I can't, I can't, I can't push it off. I can't ignore it. And I can't not tell you about it because it's a law. It's what is on the books at the moment. Marianne. So um, thank you. This is an informational, if not a little scary, um, you know, one good place for advocacy might be beginning to educate our legislators, our state legislators about particularly that, that 12 year uh, amortization time, yeah. you know, so if, if uh, 
because I find sometimes they take a couple of passes by them to understand the magnitude of what you're talking about and sort of, you know, cause they're brief meetings generally, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I just, just one quick question, or do we, is it small buses and all the vans and everything? And, um, and so this bus, am I looking at this, you're kind of expensing this year? It's that you're not doing Correct. it. Correct. Yeah. I just put it in the budget as opposed to right. put it in the proposition. I right. wanted to separate it. Right. Uh, if you told me at the end, you know, when we get right down to the end of the budget, if you didn't want to support it, it could come out. Because if you put it into the proposition and then you say you don't want to do it, then it blows up the proposition, the proposition language, and like like it's a lot more complicated. So I put it in the budget okay. as a placeholder, as a as a, a way to get started and so here's a, here's no, another sounds like a good idea. Here's another fun one for you to digest. Yeah. The um, typically you're thinking about buses and you're thinking in terms of just the day to day transport of students. When the marching band goes to Syracuse or the eighth graders go to Washington D.C., those buses can't go that far right. without having to recharge. And are we allowed? Do you know to? Sorry, I didn't mean to blurt out. Are we allowed to? You know get a coach bus like we I know they've gone to DC they they rent coach buses are we allowed to use our money to do non-electric buses you know for field um, trips my or, guess is that, that that yes we would be able to charter buses as we've always been able to charter buses but I can tell you that um, private contractors are not exempt from this so if you thought that we would privatize and go to Chappaqua bus or first student or one of those they all have to comply with this as well take an electric plane interesting yeah that's that was good that they did that though you know it, i don't know it seems I, like it, good. any other questions uh, marion oh, oh sorry ahead, larry. you're next larry after marion no oh. are you are you still electricing or is your because i'm off electric stuff i have a different question do you want to finish electric stuff no first? i'm not on electric okay just back to your number two slide with your operations and maintenance okay um the custodial at 119 personnel yes 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 yeah, yes just the number of bodies there yes. under custodial FTE, so. so right just um do we still so is is that straight custodial workers or do we still have the people that drive a bus and then go to a building as custodians or like yeah, we are they have, included we very, in that or how's that work i i included them in that number there are very few custodial bus drivers i think there's four remaining at the oh moment. that's all okay so that is that being like phased out or it, we we have been phasing that out as as through attrition okay yep. thank you okay all right um so kevin um i'm looking at slide number six and thinking that um you know that in the long term we're we're really worried about the runway, but that looks like we need a helicopter in the next couple of years. Um, will there be changes, or do we need to anticipate changes to what we're doing on a day to day basis, and who in terms of who we're transporting, or um, you know, we talked about different numbers of trips, and is this going to be a big enough crisis? Is this big enough change as it looks like it is? That we're going to have to make some dramatic changes in the short term. I, I'm going to say I, I'd like to hold off on before we do anything drastic. Um, I, I would like to maintain the programs that we have. We worked really hard by raising the wages and we've been doing uh, better. I wouldn't say that we're perfectly staffed. I would still like to have more people than, than we do, but we are we are holding our own now. We are no longer uh, uh, using as many uh, contracted services as we had at, at the beginning of the year, so we're 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 holding our own at the moment. Um, so, if if the budgets going forward get much much tighter, then you're going to be proposed with making choices at that time, and you'll have to weigh the entire entirety of the budget. So you have we have a large budget, and that large budget affords us larger opportunities to make changes and corrections but yes you'll be forced with the same wedge that all districts are which is there's never enough money to do all the programming that you would like to do so there's choices involved you know and you're going to have to weigh those choices at that time as to say 
okay, well, if we have a $5 million problem, then we have to do maybe bigger things than if we have a $1 million problem or if we have a $10 million problem. So it's going to depend on the size of the problem. It's going to depend on the year and it's going to depend on a lot of things. And then you're going to have to weigh the different options that you have. Thank you. I have something. Kelly. So I would just say that I think that it would be helpful to get sort of updates from you on what your fellow business director, colleagues in other districts, how are they interpreting or any interesting approaches? I just find it impossible to believe that we're not going to be able to have a bus to bring people on a field trip to Washington, D.C. I mean, that's ridiculous. So it'll be just be interesting to be to get updates. Maybe, maybe you can even let us know, you know, if they're having a committee meeting just to sort of be kept generally in the loop on how this is being evaluated. They're going to retire. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and I say that tongue in cheek. But many of them will, because it's it's that onerous. You're but supposed anyway. to say present company accepted. <laughs> <laughs> I did not say that. <laughs> well, hopefully cooler heads will prevail. Yeah, I, I, it, it, I think what I would say is that I believe that cooler heads will prevail, because at some point, someone's going to have to slide a number across the governor's desk or whomever's desk and say, this is really what we're talking about. This is a lot of money and we got to figure out where it's going to come from and how, how that's all going to work out. So, but I don't think that they're going to back away from this too quickly because they do want to move the dime. They do want to move organizations. They want us to figure out a new solution and they do want us to be zero emissions. So that is a real impetus behind this. They really want that. So, and they believe that there's a cost to it and they're willing to pay that cost. But how that all works out in the final budget, I, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't know. Yes, sir. Okay. Chip. Sure. Um, in, in terms of uh, the, the providers, the bus providers, um, you know, obviously every bus manufacturer has um, different specifications that they're working under, right? right. Has there been any, um, push uh, on the state's end in order to develop a specification that the whole bus provide is there so they're all going to be different and reliability yes. is going to be very different depending upon the provider that's the other thing we're going to be forced to buy something that's not proven quote unquote right. and so so yeah so there's a lot of things going on in in the in the world of vehicle manufacture so uh, first of all, China is the probably the leader in, edu in, in electrified vehicles at the moment. Uh, to my knowledge, they don't have a bus that meets New York State standards. So New York State probably has some of the most stringent standards on what a school bus ch frame, chassis, and performance is in the country. And it's why our track record of safety for student safety is probably at the highest or right at the, you know, top five in the country, it's because of those stringent um, uh, bus manufacturing requirements. They have to have safety glass. They have to have exit uh, um, uh, side exits, which is unique to New York. They have to have side emergency doors as opposed to just back emergency doors. Uh, the rails have to be of a certain thickness. The walls of the bus have to be a certain thickness. It's why you can literally run into the side of a bus and, it, and the car is going to go and the bus is not going to really do much. At They're very safe. That's, that's why they're built that way. Now you enter electrified um, companies who are trying to make these buses, but they don't really, you know, they're, they're electric bus companies, but they're not they're not New York State bus company manufacturers like New York State bus manufacturers have been Bluebirds and Internationals. And uh, I don't know what the other one is off the top. Thomas, those three have been building buses in New York State for years and generations. Those are the th those are the three big manufacturers. They're trying to to. And so so imagine their, you know, their problem. So they're making buses to try to sell to us. And now they get this rule and it probably takes three, four, five years of planning and development to switch between what it is that, that takes it from planning to actually producing a bus. And, and so, so literally when we made the recommendation this year to buy gasoline buses as opposed to propane, 
one of the reasons is it became bipropane because they stopped making them. So, because they're like, because they're trying to switch and, and roll into this electric model. So you've got an entire industry of trying to make these buses and, and, and they, and, and they don't, and they're, and they can't catch up. They can't like, they can't figure it out. And that's just the big buses. So the big buses are, are one thing. Now we got all the little buses that have to catch up and they're way behind that, that process. So the, it, there's a lot to work out. Uh, you know, but I thought I would try to give what we knew to this point. Um, this is going to be an unraveling story. It's going to be probably in the forefront of budgeting for the next several years uh, as, you know, distracting is that, I mean, we, we have programmatic things that we want to support. We've got facility things that we want to support, and we're going to be sending a lot of monies to this, which supports neither of those. So that's, that's a, that's a problem. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. Okay, moving on to new business. Our new business section of the agenda lists several items for individual resolution approval. Documentation concerning these items has been provided to our board members in advance to assure an extensive and thorough review. And our first item is a first reading. Well, we can move on from that. Uh, item C. Donations and motion. So moved. Motion and a second. second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries. I just, um, before you move on to the next one, uh, Mary Kay Kaminsky uh, was here tonight, and uh, so was uh, Carrie Phelan from the foundation, uh, along with Mark who was here with the student government um they were they wanted to present their um uh, they, they wanted to present their check to you um as part of this acceptance um so i will follow up with them on that but i just wanted to recognize and thank them um uh, they were here and i wanted to take the opportunity to thank the foundation and and give them some visibility associated with this donation. So unfortunately, they um, they decided they needed to um, uh, leave, uh, but I, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to actually personally thank them. Good point. Thank you. Okay, item D, senior citizen tax exemption. May I have a motion? So moved. And a second, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries. Item E, disability tax exemption. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. And a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries. Uh, number nine, future discussion items. Well, it's just going to be done. Oh, oh you have just to say gonna do it. It'll be on the future uh, oh. agenda. That was my misunderstanding. Yeah, I'm sorry. We don't need a motion for that, Mark. Yes, sir. Um, with regards to what uh, Dr. Moore was talking about um, for the safety and security, and you know that position, is that something that we need to request to be added on, based upon your superintendent's comments, or? Well, I just need to know what the consensus of the board is. Um, you know, I can put it on an agenda and 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 perhaps um, perhaps people won't agree and, and it won't go through. But if um, I think it'd be cleaner if I would if I had some indication if the board wanted to, you know, seriously consider uh, those two recommendations or not, or if it's not something that they, they want to at least have the ability to discuss and think about. Um, I wanted to include it in my superintendent's report in this manner because I was addressing a similar topic. If, if you want to have a discussion about that before we put it on an agenda, that's perfectly fine. Absolutely, there's no super immediate rush. How do, how do people feel? Like, let's go around the room. Ed, your thoughts? The, uh, I would like to see it on a uh, on a on a separate agenda, or a separate agenda on an agenda in the future. Uh, 
the because uh, I think it, it needs some discussion uh, in in this in this regard. The two recommendations made are fine. I, as a matter of fact, I think uh, it's sort of a wave of what's happening across uh, most school districts. But I also what I don't understand is the human side of of what we're doing to improve quality and and the mental state. Uh, that we're trying, the things that we're doing through the mental state of students and staff and board members about as it relates to safety. So I, I don't think it's a, um, I'm not sure that adding more law enforcement, more people to, to insist on structure without understanding some of the underlying reasons why there's so much why well, there's so much chaos in, uh, in the system, in schools. And, I, and, and you can make the argument it's universal, but I can't, I can't do anything universally. But I'd like to have that as, as part of the discussion as we move forward. Right. Linda? Um, I too would like to have further discussion, but I do uh, appreciate both of those suggestions and okay. the great, great ideas. Yelly? So I would agree that a discussion would be helpful just to sort of un understand, as Ed was saying, all the undercurrents. I mean, I, I don't have a problem at this point with either the position or a committee, although I think our board committee has been very effective. So I wouldn't want having a district-wide committee with parents and staff to mean that we wouldn't have a board committee. Larry? Uh, I, I agree. I'd like to have uh, the two things as probably separate uh, future discussion items, the internal candidate and the health and safety. And also just, I, I need to understand how, how the dirt and the health and safety would interact or whether one supplants the other one. Okay. I, I could tell you right now that the dirt would still exist and they would interact, but we could explain conceptually. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was comfortable with the, with what was proposed as far as, um, the uh, the the hiring of a director of safety and the creation of a committee that um, that fulfills the requirement from the state, uh, but it sounds like many of us have just sort of related questions about related things around that. So I'd be very comfortable with the discussion about that. But personally, I'd like to move forward with the recommendations too, if that's part of the process. To move forward. Okay. I assume you're a yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say that my, I'll formally request that we have a future discussion. I there, we there we go. There we go. So okay. when I'm thinking about how we would handle, how, what, there's a couple different ways that could be handled, but the easiest thing to do is probably just list it under reports and presentations and um, try to reflect in that presentation not only the the nature of the proposals themselves, you know, like clarify, go into some detail at the board table, but because um, I did obviously did very much of an overview type of a, a thing tonight. And then the other one, um, the other pieces of it, like like the, the, the total processes that are in place and, and the um, things that we're trying to do in terms of restorative practices or in terms of addressing health and wellness needs of students, um, I have said before, um, you know, tonight I thought it was important to emphasize that we take these things seriously, but I'm not comfortable with the number of suspensions that we've had. And I do think that we need to try to be preventative and proactive in everything that we do. Um, it, it, it has been very challenging in recent times with some of the things that we're dealing with. Um, so to explain what we've been trying to put in place, how we've been trying to handle some of those things, we could do that as part of a presentation. Um, and then we could put the actual motion for each of those two items on, on a subsequent agenda. Does that work for people? That I, like I, I didn't understand the last. You would, you would separate. What was the separation? For well, Larry, Larry yeah. came to indicate that when it comes time to actually voting on these, that they should be separate votes, which I, I think makes sense. Or um, I, I think something to that effect that he didn't, he didn't want the, both of these things combined into one proposal. So, so, um, 
So when we actually would put them on an agenda for a vote, we could we could vote on each item separately if you wanted to do it that way. If you want to do it as one, I, it's probably better to do it in two separate ones. That's what I was referring to anyway. Yeah, the, that can be part of the discussion. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think you need to have that as a discussion because I am, because I'm not big on surprises. Let me just tell you, I, I'm, rather than creating a committee, do we need to worry about consolidating? Uh, are we interested in consolidating our efforts as part of the job description for this new position that would encompass health, health and safety for the entire district? So, so is that a, uh, I, I don't know if committees would in this area would accomplish that much, but could we put more boots on the ground to, to actively reflect on uh, improving the health and safety issues, mental health, physical safety issues within the, uh, within the uh, in district? Now, are those two separate things? Uh, do we, is one impacting the other? Uh, we haven't been able to disaggregate them such that to, to put them into two separate pieces and to put it into a committee is not actionable. It is, a, it, it, um, uh, there's another step after that to make, make something actionable happen. So I, so I, I don't have the answers. I have a bunch of questions. It, what, how, do we, how do we get our arms around this with, the, uh, uh, with making the health and safety directorship, which I, which I am in favor of, but I'd like to see the job description and a little more ro a robust job description is what I would argue for in terms of um, execution of the of the of an improvement plan and what has been uh, issued for the last two, three years is, that, is, um, that is having significant implications for the district. So I, I uh, and maybe there's two different things there, but it, I just would like to have that discussion once and for all. Let's, let's talk about it, fix it, not, not piecemeal it. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, I think we got Did it. you go all the way Well, Mary, I, I think I. I don't think you Mary Ann was. I think Chip was the last one. No. Well, uh, once we got to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. You know, yeah. just kind of like. Doesn't matter. It, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, all right. That's, it's I fine. Want you to I, think, I think. Well, we'll hear from Mary Ann and Dave in, in any event. They're, they're part of my board. I. I think in the proposal that Dave gave us, what I'm interested in making sure that we you talk about, you've already put it on paper here, but you stated that what we're currently doing is not meeting the letter of New York State law in terms of a health and safety committee. That's is correct. That, so it, te technically there are functions designated by law that are don't happen in the dirt committee because that is is structured for different purposes. Um, and so um, if, you, if you actually read, and I think I put a link to it in your proposal, if you actually read, you, you'd be able to see the differences between what, what is specified in that uh, requirement versus what we currently have. Right, perfect. So I'm just saying, I think that should be part of this presentation slash discussion so that um, we can clearly understand what's missing from what we're currently doing. Um, and so I have no problem with the further discussion and that's it. Good, Dave. All right, I, I, Marianne said it exactly what I was gonna say uh, with the emphasizing of the fact that we're not compliant. And then I don't, I don't think we wanna be known as some an organization that's not compliant with something. So I think that's something we need to keep in mind during our discussion. Okay. Thank you. All right, moving on. Business consent agenda. Our consented section of the agenda lists several items 
for approval by a single motion. Documentation concerning these items has been provided to our board members in advance to assure an extensive and thorough review. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. And a second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Motion carries. We are now on item 11. Public comment or non-agenda items. And this is the second of two opportunities for people to address the board. Please state your name and address. Although we do not engage in dialogue, we are listening. Disparaging remarks concerning specific individuals or positions are prohibited. You leave your contact information with Mrs. Flynn, our district clerk, the superintendent, or one of his staff will contact you as soon as possible. Mrs. Flynn. Okay. Come for it. Hi, my name is Tony Gruden. I live on Overlook Road. And I'm an Arlington High School graduate, and I have one kid still in the district. The main reason why I'm here stems from the fight, but there are at least five people right now whose names I'll never give you, but are in our district who do not live in our district. They get dropped off at different bus stops. My suggestion is, and I would be willing to do it, is investigate if these kids really belong in our district. There's, there's a lot of fights that are happening. There's a lot, I hear a lot of things. There's so many kids that do not belong in our district. There are kids who have permission and are legal in our district, but what about the kids that are sneaking in or they're using their grandparents' address or their uncle's address? Sorry, that's not allowed. I pay a lot of money to live in Arlington. Nobody else should be here. And I heard a rumor that the girl who got in the fight, they couldn't find her. She doesn't live in our district. How is this allowed to happen? We, when I first moved in here, we got letters saying, if you see something, there's someone who doesn't belong, you send it in. How come that's not done anymore? And that's it. But I'm very, I, I don't even know how to put it. We definitely have to do something about the security. And I appreciate what you're doing. And I hope that it comes through. I tell the girls, because I drop four off every morning, wear your IDs. You have to have your ID. I personally think you don't have your ID, go home. Call your mom and dad, get your ID, and then you come back in. Stop giving in to these kids. We have to be stricter. It's not, we didn't go through this when I was in this school. If you did something wrong, you got in trouble. And that's how it has to be from now on. There's too many parents who let their kids do whatever. So that's, that's it. But I definitely want, I will do it. You tell me, you give me a job, whatever. I will not be, I'm good at investigating. I will find out who does not belong in our district. And then I'll give it to you guys. And then you take it up, get them out of our district if they don't belong here. Because too many parents talk about it, and there's too many people who say, oh, I see this one at the bus, this one at the bus, and they get dropped off. And, and how does that get through? How are they getting through to do that? They just lie, and nobody checks up on it. It has to be checked up on. And I'm the investigator, so you can call me. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. I rarely comment in return, but I'm going to make a comment this time. You said you, you pay a lot to come in this district. We well, the people that are coming in this district that don't belong here, we need to do something about. So, if we find out about them, if someone tells us and does the right thing, so that we can police these people, then they won't be in our district. We'll happily take the information. Thank you. Okay, on that note, moving on. Committee reports. Uh, policy. Our next meeting is Monday, January 30th at 5.30 here in Central Office. Thank you. Audit finance. Nothing at this time. Advocacy. I sent you all stimulating uh, minutes from our meeting last uh, Tuesday, last night, I believe is when I hit the send button. Um, just to recap, we had three items on the agenda 
uh, last Tuesday, we talked about the um, possibility that's been mentioned, um, a required COVID vaccination uh, for school attendance. We talked about the region's deliberations on graduation requirements and seat time. And then the third item was the DCC tuition for dual enrollment courses. And what I would like to give, you can read the minutes to see what our thoughts were on number one and two. Um, some of this is going to be um, discussed, particularly the region's thing, seat time, um, the electric bus thing, things that we, we can uh, discuss, a couple of us at least are going up to Albany next month on the 15th to sit in the space with our legislators. So we will, in our allotted little time with them, mention those items. But the one that um, I would like to just get a straw poll tonight, if I could, from everybody is the letter writing to our county legislators um, regarding the DCC tuition. Um, so if that doesn't make anybody's hair curl or they don't want to have us pursue that, I would like to, um, the superintendents have just sent their letter off. Dave has supplied me with a copy of that letter. Um, all of the superintendents and boards of education through um, BOCES spearheading for the county have been asked that that is probably our best um, avenue at this point in time to help support students who would have difficulty paying that tuition moving forward. Mm -hmm. So if that's, no. if I can have a thumbs up from people, if it's okay that we do that. Is this a, a letter that we, you know, compose ourselves or is it a form letter? It's not a form letter. It okay. will get be composed. Um, I'm going to talk to Dave about the logistics of that. Okay. Um, we'll probably use some of the information on their letter as a template and send it from the Board of Education of Arlington yeah. once I get that all put together. But I just want to know if it's okay to move forward with such a letter. Anybody disagree with that? Okay, and I will share, obviously, you because your names would go on it. It will be shared before anything is happening, but I wanted to make sure it was okay to keep rolling on. I believe they meet in February. Is that correct, Dave? The legislature? Yeah, the so target date, if this is going to happen, um, and it's, it's and, soon, that right? Which is why yeah, I'd like I, to. I would get that letter out uh, before the end of the month because I, I believe that the intent is, is that they will reconsider the issue in February. Right, that's and it's what, very important that um, I mean, I, if we, if for some reason or another that drags on where they don't act, even if they do do something, it really puts schools in a difficult position to try to figure out um, staffing and scheduling. And each school has unique circumstances as it relates to their enrollment and their their demographics. And so, it's um, if the county's going to do something, it would be wonderful if they would do it as soon as possible. And to my knowledge, their intent at this time anyway is to reconsider this in February. Okay. And, you know, Mary, and this is something that the students at the high school are talking about. I mean, my son said something to me. So they're aware of what's going on, maybe from the guidance counselors, the teachers. So this is definitely something that our community is talking about and it's right. concerned about. Well, there was an article in the school paper um, that may some some people may have seen that, but there was also a direct letter that went home from the high school. So, um, so that was you know that that's another hit to just try to give people a heads up of what's what's coming out, what's coming down. All right. Okay. okay. We'll move forward with that. Right. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Health and safety. Yes, I. Um, requested a meeting for next Thursday, the second, and heard from um, majority of our committee members that that date works. So, uh, Margie, don't be uh, angry with me. I was going to get to you next. Uh, we will have a meeting uh, next Thursday, six thirty, here at the high, uh, here at central office. Okay. Can I ask one quick question about that DCC thing uh, to Dave? Yes. Are based on the timing of the legislature. Are we gearing up? How are we helping kids with uh, signing up for classes? 
Like, are we gonna say to them? Right now, wait we're see? right now. Well, right now, we're informing them of what they what we know, um, and we don't know what the county's going to do. Um, but could we? Are we like? Are we telling them, hey, if this is a class you're interested in and you're on free or reduced lunch, sign up now, and we'll help you rework your schedule if we don't secure funding through the county. Right. I, I don't I don't know if that's the specific language that the counselors are right. using. Um, so I, I guess I would have to verify and confirm how we're trying to coach those kids. Um, I think most of the kids are looking at um, other options because of the uncertainty. Right. I would hope that they almost don't like so because if they if they don't sign up for those classes and then we end up getting the funding and a whole bunch of them didn't take those classes. You know, that's 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 a real shame. Or we go back and we allow them to re-register or something. I don't know. That I don't unexpect well, you honestly, I didn't expect you to have an answer on the spot, but that's a consideration knowing that we're right in that sort of heart of the time that the, the guidance counselors start meeting with kids about next year. Yeah, we we might be able to approach kids individually about some schedule changes. Um it we try to inform the um we tried to inform people of the fact that this this timeline is very very inconvenient for all of our schools, but you know these things are kind of out of our control. We're right. we're just doing our best. Right. I'll try to I'll try to follow up on that. All right. Thank you. I have a question on that. Is that something that the Arlington Education Foundation could help subsidize some kids who are in need? Uh, I think that that would be very difficult for them because the estimated when we sent in. The estimated numbers for Arlington, it was about $250,000. Oh. Wow. All right. Uh, can I have a, a motion to uh, extend the meeting to 920, please? So mm -hmm. moved. Second. What did you say, 915? 920. Okay. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries. And now we're moving on to organizational reports. Dutchess County School Boards Association. Uh, not at this time. We'll have another meeting before they meet again. Oh, no, we, actually, we won't. So the, the first meeting of, of uh, February will be before we meet on the 14th. And everyone will get the notice. I don't know the topic at this time. I can get to the date in a minute. You can go on to somebody else. So it could be as soon as next Thursday if she's doing the second. Yeah, I think it probably is it, next Thursday. It may be February yeah. 2nd. It's usually the first Thursday yeah. of the month. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Arlington Education Foundation. Uh, we are having a meeting on February 1st. We have a new executive director, Amy Green, who was here early, uh, was going to be here tonight, but uh, I guess couldn't make it. Um, and of course, Mary Beth is uh, retiring. So uh, we have a new director. Uh, Dave, you have anything to add? No, um, I, I don't at this point. Okay. Uh, move on. PTA, PTSA. Tomorrow night they'll be meeting. They postponed a week. Um, and tomorrow night is their virtual meeting. Okay. Thank you. Um, Update Dutchess County BOCES. Um, sometimes we get that through the Dutchess County School Boards, but just to remind everybody, those tours are available if you'd like to see the new facility. Okay. Arlington Connect. Uh, just a, a reminder, we had to cancel because of weather this Monday's uh, meeting, uh, most important meeting on, on how the school district communicates with you, uh, how you want to receive communications, how you want to be able to reach us. Um, this is Earl Bacher will be presenting. Uh, we, we have rescheduled it for Monday, uh, January 31st, which is this coming Tuesday, Monday. Tuesday, 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 Tuesday. Yeah, I wrote Tuesday. I just said Monday. Um, and uh, seven to nine at the high school cafeteria C. Hope a lot of people will come because uh, we need information from our community. Okay. Thank you. Any other organizations? And okay. Superintendent's closing his remarks. Yeah, I know. I promise. You already I'm made sorry. it. I know. I you know, already I made it. So I know. Wait, move on. No. Um, it, it's it's very interesting because um, uh, in relation to residency, 
so sometimes when new families come to register for the district, um, our registrar's office gets accused of being too strict on the requirements. Um, and so we have to we have to try to work with people on documents and other things like that. But it's it's a pretty extensive process to verify residency. Uh, that doesn't mean that um, that we don't have people that um, try to circumvent that process. Uh, I have instructed our registrar's office, our student services people, and our schools to be very very stringent on residency. So when our um, uh, school secretaries get uh, mail bounced back to them, for example, and other things like that. It initiates a process to investigate. Um, and so there, uh, <coughs> there is, you know, there are some things related to um, if somebody is, is technically by the McKinney Veto Act um, declared homeless, um, they're they're allowed to enroll and, and remain in the district and so there are some different laws and things like that that not everybody may realize but if we do have information about people not living at the correct address we do investigate and we do initiate that process um so um i i um i've instructed people to be very very um vigilant about that particular issue i wanted to um make sure that people were aware of that. The second thing is that um, our school resource officer, uh, Deputy Alonzo Montoya is actually here tonight. He is the um, person in the back of the room. And I wanted to just um, indicate that we do have a lot of county and statewide and, and, and mechanisms in place uh, to, to try to create school safety that a lot of people may not realize from national notifications and and other different things like that, that people are constantly monitoring. People are constantly monitoring social media sites. It's There's a lot of things that go on that people don't know. Um, and Deputy Montoya is the co-chair of the Dutchess County School Safety Advisory Committee. So he is very, very in tune, um, uh, you know, in real time about various different things that are going on. Um, if you'd like to, if you've never met Deputy Montoya and would like to say hello to him, just want to make that opportunity available for you. Um, and now I actually am uh, done. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, let's see here. What do we got? We have reflections and board reflections. Marion. Just um, some of us were there, but the, the MLK tribute um, last Wednesday evening was magnificent as always but maybe more magnificent because it was back in person um after our hiatus with the pandemic so it was i i was commenting to someone i think what i find the most cool about that event is that it transcends our k-12 population so you you get a flavoring of all different age groups that are participating in that event so it's it's cool and a uh, shout out to Melissa for being our organizer. It's a great thing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Dave. Yeah, I'm sitting here feeling pretty stupid about the fact that I didn't take the opportunity while Mary Beth was here to go over and thank her and give her a big hug um, and thank her for all that she did. I thought maybe she was going to stick around a little bit and hopefully I'll have the opportunity to um, express my appreciation. I remember when the foundation started um, and, uh, you know, seeing her, her moving on after all her work that she's done, um, I just feel bad about the fact that I didn't really get a chance to, to express myself to her personally. So I thought I would do it right now and maybe it'll get to her some way or somehow. So thank you. Thank you. You know, Kelly. I, I will say that I have gone to some Arlington girls basketball games of late. I have a superstar niece who plays for Arlington High School, and I want to say that they're doing a great job, and it's really enjoyable to see them play. Very good. Larry. And, and I just wanted to echo what Marion had said and, and, said, and, and let the huge audience that we have here uh, know that, uh, that that Martin Luther King tribute you know was a, a, a thing you leave you left there with chills it, it was really 
amazing. Uh, our faculty and our students are real. You know, we we we're talking about some unpleasant stuff, but there is so much great stuff happening in this district. Thank you. Going, going. Anyone else? Hey, I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstentions. Motion carries. Meeting was adjourned.